Section 12. Macbeth. From Beautiful Stories from Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Beautiful Stories from Shakespeare by Edith Nesbitt Macbeth When a person is asked to tell the story of Macbeth, he can tell two stories. One is of a man called Macbeth, who came to the throne of Scotland by a crime, in the year of our Lord, 1039, and reigned justly and well, on the whole, for fifteen years or more. This story is part of Scottish history. The other story issues from a place called Imagination. It is gloomy and wonderful, and you shall hear it. A year or two before Edward the Confessor began to rule England, a battle was won in Scotland against a Norwegian king by two generals named Macbeth and Banquo. After the battle, the generals walked together towards Forres, in Elginshire, where Duncan, King of Scotland, was awaiting them. While they were crossing a lonely heath, they saw three bearded women, sisters, hand in hand, withered in appearance and wild in their attire. "'Speak! Who are you?' demanded Macbeth. "'Hail, Macbeth, chieftain of Glamis,' said the first woman. "'Hail, Macbeth, chieftain of Cawdor,' said the second woman. "'Hail, Macbeth, king that is to be,' said the third woman. Then Banquo asked, "'What of me?' And the third woman replied, "'Thou shalt be the father of kings.' "'Tell me more,' said Macbeth. By my father's death I am chieftain of Glamis, but the chieftain of Cawdor lives, and the king lives, and his children live. Speak, I charge you. The woman replied only by vanishing, as though suddenly mixed with the air. Banquo and Macbeth knew then that they had been addressed by witches, and were discussing their prophecies when two nobles approached. One of them thanked Macbeth, in the king's name, for his military services, and the other said, He bade me call you Chieftain of Cawdor. Macbeth then learned that the man who had yesterday borne that title was to die for treason, and he could not help thinking, The third witch called me King that is to be. Banquo, he said, you see that the witches spoke truth concerning me. Do you not believe, therefore, that your child and grandchild will be kings? Banquo frowned. Duncan had two sons, Malcolm and Donalbane, and he deemed it disloyal to hope that his son, Fleance, should rule Scotland. He told Macbeth, that the witches might have intended to tempt them both into villainy by their prophecies concerning the throne. Macbeth, however, thought the prophecy that he should be king too pleasant to keep to himself, and he mentioned it to his wife in a letter. Lady Macbeth was the granddaughter of a king of Scotland, who had died in defending his crown against the king who preceded Duncan, and by whose order her only brother was slain. To her, Duncan was a reminder of bitter wrongs. Her husband had royal blood in his veins, and when she read his letter, she was determined that he should be king. When a messenger arrived to inform her that Duncan would pass a night in Macbeth's castle, she nerved herself for a very base action. She told Macbeth almost as soon as she saw him that Duncan must spend a sunless morrow. She meant that Duncan must die, and that the dead are blind. We will speak further, said Macbeth uneasily, and, at night, 
with his memory full of Duncan's kind words, he would fain have spared his guest. "'Would you live a coward?' demanded Lady Macbeth, who seems to have thought that morality and cowardice were the same. "'I dare do all that may become a man,' replied Macbeth. "'Who dare do more is none.' "'Why did you write that letter to me?' she inquired fiercely, and with bitter words egged him on to murder, and with cunning words she showed him how to do it. After supper Duncan went to bed, and two grooms were placed on guard at his bedroom door. Lady Macbeth caused them to drink wine till they were stupefied. She then took their daggers, and would have killed the king herself, if his sleeping face had not looked like her father's. Macbeth came later, and found the daggers lying by the grooms, and soon, with red hands, he appeared before his wife, saying, Methought I heard a voice cry, Sleep no more, Macbeth destroys the sleeping. Wash your hands, said she. Why did you not leave the daggers by the grooms? Take them back, and smear the grooms with blood. I dare not, said Macbeth. His wife dared, and she returned to him with hands red as his own, but a heart less white, she proudly told him, for she scorned his fear. The murderers heard a knocking, and Macbeth wished it was a knocking which could wake the dead. It was the knocking of Macduff, the chieftain of Fife, who had been told by Duncan to visit him early. Macbeth went to him, and showed him the door of the king's room. Macduff entered, and came out again, crying, Oh, horror, horror, horror! Macbeth appeared as horror-stricken as Macduff, and, pretending that he could not bear to see life in Duncan's murderers, he slew the two grooms with their own daggers, before they could proclaim their innocence. These murders did not shriek out, and Macbeth was crowned at Scone. One of Duncan's sons went to Ireland, the other to England. Macbeth was king. But he was discontented. The prophecy concerning Banquo oppressed his mind. If Fleance were to rule, a son of Macbeth would not rule. Macbeth determined, therefore, to murder both Banquo and his son. He hired two ruffians, who slew Banquo one night when he was on his way with Fleance to a banquet which Macbeth was giving to his nobles. Fleance escaped. Meanwhile, Macbeth and his queen received their guests very graciously, and he expressed a wish for them which has been uttered thousands of times since his day. Now, good digestion, weight on appetite, and health on both. We pray your majesty to sit with us, said Lennox, a Scotch noble. But ere Macbeth could reply, the ghost of Banquo entered the banqueting hall, and sat in Macbeth's place. Not noticing the ghost, Macbeth observed that if Banquo were present, he could say that he had collected under his roof the choicest chivalry of Scotland. Macduff, however, had curtly declined his invitation. The king was again pressed to take a seat, and Lennox, to whom Banquo's ghost was invisible, showed him the chair where it sat. But Macbeth with his eyes of genius, saw the ghost. He saw it like a form of mist and blood, and he demanded passionately, Which of you have done this? Still, none saw the ghost but he, and to the ghost Macbeth said, Thou canst not say I did it. The ghost glided out, and Macbeth was impudent enough to raise a glass of wine to the general joy of the whole table, and to our dear friend Banquo, whom we miss. The toast was drunk, as the ghost of Banquo entered for the second time. 
Be gone, cried Macbeth. You are senseless, mindless. Hide in the earth, thou horrible shadow. Again, none saw the ghost but he. What is it your majesty sees? asked one of the nobles. The queen dared not permit an answer to be given to this question. She hurriedly begged her guests to quit a sick man, who was likely to grow worse if he was obliged to talk. Macbeth, however, was well enough next day to converse with the witches whose prophecies had so depraved him. He found them in a cavern on a thunderous day. They were revolving round a cauldron in which were boiling particles of many strange and horrible creatures, and they knew he was coming before he arrived. "'Answer me what I ask you,' said the king. "'Would you rather hear it from us or our masters?' asked the first witch. "'Call them,' replied Macbeth. Thereupon the witches poured blood into the cauldron, and grease into the flame that licked it, and a helmeted head appeared with the visor on, so that Macbeth could only see its eyes. He was speaking to the head, when the first witch said gravely, He knows thy thought. And a voice in the head said, Macbeth, beware Macduff, the chieftain of Fife. The head then descended into the cauldron, till it disappeared. One word more, pleaded Macbeth. He will not be commanded, said the first witch. And then a crowned child ascended from the cauldron, bearing a tree in his hand. The child said, Macbeth shall be unconquerable till the wood of Burnham climbs Dunsinane Hill. That never will be, said Macbeth and he asked to be told if Banquo's descendants would ever rule Scotland. The cauldron sank into the earth, music was heard, and a procession of phantom kings filed past Macbeth. Behind them was Banquo's ghost. In each king Macbeth saw a likeness to Banquo, and he counted eight kings. Then. He was suddenly left alone. His next proceeding was to send murderers to Macduff's castle. They did not find Macduff, and asked Lady Macduff where he was. She gave a stinging answer, and her questioner called Macduff a traitor. Thou liest, shouted Macduff's little son, who was immediately stabbed, and with his last breath, entreated his mother to fly. The murderers did not leave the castle, while one of its inmates remained alive. Macduff was in England, listening with Malcolm to a doctor's tale of cures wrought by Edward the Confessor, when his friend Ross came to tell him that his wife and children were no more. At first, Ross dared not speak the truth, and turned Macduff's bright sympathy with sufferers relieved by royal virtue into sorrow and hatred. But when Malcolm said that England was sending an army into Scotland against Macbeth, Ross blurted out his news, and Macduff cried, All dead, did you say, all my pretty ones and their mother? Did you say all? His sorry hope was in revenge. But if he could have looked into Macbeth's castle on Dunsinane Hill, he would have seen at work a force more solemn than revenge. Retribution was working, for Lady Macbeth was mad. She walked in her sleep amid ghastly dreams. She was wont to wash her hands for a quarter of an hour at a time, but after all her washing would still see a red spot of blood upon her skin. It was pitiful to hear her cry that all the perfumes of Arabia could not sweeten her little hand. Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased? 
inquired Macbeth of the doctor. But the doctor replied that his patient must minister to her own mind. This reply gave Macbeth a scorn of medicine. Throw physic to the dogs, he said. I'll none of it. One day he heard a sound of women crying. An officer approached him and said, The Queen, Your Majesty, is dead. Out, brief candle, muttered Macbeth, meaning that life was like a candle, at the mercy of a puff of air. He did not weep. He was too familiar with death. Presently a messenger told him that he saw Burnham Wood on the march. Macbeth called him a liar and a slave, and threatened to hang him if he had made a mistake. If you are right, you can hang me, he said. From the turret, windows of Dunsinane Castle, Burnham Wood did indeed appear to be marching. Every soldier of the English army held aloft a bough which he had cut from a tree in that wood, and, like human trees, they climbed Dunsinane Hill. Macbeth had still his courage. He went to battle to conquer or die, and the first thing he did was to kill the general's son in single combat. Macbeth then felt that no man could fight him and live, and when Macduff came to him, blazing for revenge, Macbeth said to him, Go back, I have spilt too much of your blood already. My voice is in my sword, replied Macduff, and hacked at him, and bade him yield. I will not yield, said Macbeth, but his last hour had struck. He fell. Macbeth's men were in retreat when Macduff came before Malcolm, holding a king's head by the hair. Hail, king, he said, and the new king looked at the old. So Malcolm reigned after Macbeth, but in years that came afterwards, the descendants of Banquo were kings. End of section 12. Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California. For LibriVox. Fall 2007.